The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He's a very good friend of mine, someone I had the opportunity to hang out with in Puerto Rico, and he is one of the top digital marketers in the planet, or on the planet Earth right now. His name is Eric Sue. Eric, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show, my friend. Thanks so much, George, for having me. Excited to be here again. So let's, for my viewers who don't know your backstory, I think I interviewed you, but it was, man, maybe six months ago, something like that. I think it was a quick interview. So get us up to speed there. And then what I want to do is, number one, go over your book. And then I want to dig into how someone that is thinking about setting up a plan B can actually set up a, a business side hustle, whatever you want to call it, that gives them the flexibility and the freedom to actually travel and kind of go where they're treated best, to use a term from our, our good buddy, Andrew Henderson. Yeah. So again, thanks for having me. So my name's Eric Sue, and I help level up the world through marketing. So all the things, things I do, the content I create, it's really all around marketing and business. And then my businesses are all tied to marketing. So I try to stay within my circle of confidence. We've got a software company, an ad agency, a training company, an events business that will be back later this year. Um, and you know, I invest in other kind of MarTech SaaS companies. So um, that's basically what I do. And then um, got a podcast called Leveling Up and then the book over here called Leveling Up. And uh, <laughs> Marketing School is another podcast I do with another marketer named Neil Patel. So I try to keep busy, but I try to focus around what I'm good at. Yeah. So if you're someone that has thought about setting up a blog, setting up a YouTube channel, a podcast, you know, growing an email list, having a, 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 a business that isn't location or is location independent, I guess that's kind of the buzzword everyone's using, then then Eric's really your guy. I mean, he's he's the, the, the top of the totem pole when it comes to experience and knowledge in that type of business. So, I mean, how do we do it, man? How do we do it? If we're someone that's kind of stuck in a nine to five gig and you're thinking, man, I don't like what's happening in the United States. I've been listening to George or I've been listening to Andrew Henderson. I really want to set up a plan B. Maybe I'm not ready to get a second passport or something like that, but uh, maybe you are. And you're thinking, how can I do that when I'm tied to this job? I, I can't just, you know, that money doesn't grow on trees. So what can that person do to get the ball rolling to where they could grow a business online and get that financial independence they're looking for. Yeah, so I'm gonna experience share here and hopefully that's enough to give people something to do. And you tell me if you wanna dive deeper on it, but yeah. I feel like experience share will be enough. Okay. So when I was 25 years old, I was working a nine to five um, and I was working at this media company and I decided to start a side hustle, which was kind of a SEO consulting or marketing consulting work. What happened was one of the leads from my website reached out to the company and it went all the way up to the COO. The next day, the COO fired me for starting a side hustle. And at that very moment, I was like, oh, wow, like I'm either going to feel really sad or happy. And I was actually really excited. So that happened immediately. But here's a practical thing you can do. Before that, I was taking a full time paycheck while I was doing a side hustle. So I was making an additional, you know, let's call it, I don't know. 30, 40 grand a year, right? And so 25 years old, um, making six figures, it's great, right? I never thought I'd make six figures growing up. Um, and so, you know, what, what happened there was they found out, okay, got busted. And then I, I, I went full in on the, the um, consulting side of things, right? And what happened afterwards was the work I was putting in. So A, I was taking a full-time paycheck and then doing the side hustle. That's one thing. The other thing was I was creating content on websites like Quora at the time, which is a question and answer yeah. website. So it was the new hotness. And a lot of people were posting questions around marketing. I was just answering questions about a couple of weeks later, after I got fired, I got a $30,000 a month retainer um, to help a company that saw one of my answers on Quora. In mm -hmm. addition to that, Someone else offered me a 5% profit share and about uh, 250 grand a year, right? So things were stacking very quickly. Um, so I think if it's, you want to dip your toe into water first, that's what I did. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, I built up, I built up some content. I built up some leverage over there where I started to kind of reap the rewards. So um, largely I've been executing um, on the content playbook. It's still been compounding over time, 
But my thesis has always been to, you know, once I get a good cash flow business growing, like a like an agency type of business, great cash flows, very hard to scale. Um, I would use that as a funding mechanism to go find more durable sources of, of revenue, right? So eventually I took over a agency called Single Grain, which is the agency I own now. I bought the company for $2 out of pocket, right? It's not as glamorous as it sounds. I actually almost tanked the whole thing. Um, <laughs> and what happened afterwards was fortunately we're able to turn it around because we had a great team. And um, that's allowed me to do all the things that I'm doing now. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great eight figure business. And um, I just, yeah, I don't need to say, hey, I need an angel check or anything like that. I just keep growing cash flows and then um, I go invest in whatever I want. Yeah, well, imagine that in today's day and age, a business that actually makes money, a business that's actually profitable, Who can knew? reinvest profits and doesn't need investors, doesn't need the Fed, doesn't need money printing in order to continue on long into the future. <laughs> yep. Who You're knew, a right? dinosaur, Eric, my goodness. But what? Uh, how'd you learn the marketing thing in the first place? Yeah, so I was actually, I came out of college during the, the financial crisis. So I couldn't find any job really. I, I got a data entry job paying me 32 grand a year. And um, I was like, oh, this is it. This is me doing data entry. <laughs> and then I saw a guy that was 10 years older than me um, and he went to Harvard. I'm like, he's doing the same job as me. At that moment, I was like, I need to get the hell out of here. Wow. So my friend, um, she's like, oh, you got to check out this, this digital marketing thing. She got an internship. I got one at the same time. And from that point on, I, I never looked back. That's when the, the, the hunger for learning really turned on. I just, that's mm -hmm. the thing I found. I was like, oh, I just need to stick to this. So, okay. So now let's kind of dive into the, the, the premise of the book. And before, or when you were a kid, you were really into video games. And if I understand kind of, uh, what you've been, I've heard you talk about this on the podcast with, with Neil, where that really kind of shaped your thinking. You know, it's a very similar to my story in Blackjack, where I played Blackjack. You know, I, I read uh, Ed Thorpe's Beat the Dealer, and that was kind of my aha moment. But it really trained my brain to think in terms of probabilities, which really helped me in business and now helps me a lot in, in investing. But I still try to maintain that same framework. And I think you kind of had this similar type of thing in gaming, didn't you? Yeah. So I'll relate it to your story. So I played a ton of poker in college. So about 10 to 14 hours a day. I never went to class because all the all the econ kids went to this thing called econ tutor. And we basically automatically all got B's because the tutor just basically shared the answers with us. So <laughs> that was great. Um, and so I, I played a ton of poker. And to your point, the one thing you learn about poker is you can bring your A game three, six, 12 months at a time and variants can still hit you and you could lose all 12 months. Um, and so it teaches you to be resilient. It also teaches you to manage your tilt or your frustration. Um, and so that ties directly in with business. And so the other thing is you talk about thinking in probabilities or, or thinking in bets. You, it forces you to think long term. That's one thing or else you fail. And it forces you to think in, into bets like. Sometimes if, if, if there's a, if those of you that know how to play poker, if there are a couple of opponents in on Texas Hold'em and you have a straight flush draw, I'm probably going all in, right? Like I'm, I'm a slight favorite. I'm going to go all in, right? And we'll see what, where the chips fall. And um, that's not the way to invest, but I'm just saying that's what happened. And that's largely how I looked at the single grain, quote unquote, acquisition when I bought it for $2. Because my thinking at the time was, even though Neil was a partner, he's like, dude, you should get out. There's no brand equity. There's nothing here. As a friend, you should get out. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, there's an asymmetric bet here. There's asymmetric upside because if I win, there's unlimited upside. If I lose, I get the, I gain the experience of running a company. And then I've capped my downside because I put in a contingency saying that the company fail, I, I would owe nothing. Um, it was a lot harder than I think it would, that I thought it would be, but that largely ties in with my, what my poker thinking, right? It's, it's an all in bet, but was it really all in? I think it was heads. I win tails. I don't lose much. Yeah. But the, then how did the, the, the video games help you with the marketing side of it? Yeah. I've heard so, you talk about that with Neil. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, largely the book is, is how I think about life as a game every day. Like it's just, it's fun to play. And so yeah. I remember one of my buddies, um, he, he worked in investment banking at Goldman. He, he, you know, worked at a startup as well. And he was looking at what I was doing one day because we, we, we tried and failed at a senior living business. And he's like, dude, this is just like how we were playing games in high school. Like we played a lot of strategy games. We played a lot of first person shooters. And, and so the beauty of, of the marketing world is I can keep switching. So I can do podcasts like this. We can create videos. We can do webinars. We can do email stuff. Or I, I think, you know, doing deals or hiring people, like all these things are little games. And I wake up every day. It's like, which game do I get to play? Um, and so to me, 
business and marketing both feel like games. I, I'm, I'm sure you feel that like what you're doing is very much just fun every day. Yeah. Well, I enjoy it also. I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I retired exactly. in 2012 and uh, I just got super passionate about macro. I, the, the investing component is something I had to do because I didn't want to let anyone else manage my money. And I didn't have enough money to where I could just live off you know, my savings. I needed to make about a six or 7% return yeah. in order to maintain my lifestyle if not dr without drawing down my savings. Yeah. So, but then I got into macro through the free to choose series with Milton Friedman. And that's what took me down the rabbit hole. Then I just became obsessed and I was just passionate about it. Yeah. And then, you know, with the YouTube channel, basically, I just started talking about it and I had a huge edge because I did the TV commercial prior to that. But the whole point is, you know, with what I do on YouTube or the podcast or any of that, I would literally be doing the exact same thing if I had a YouTube channel or not. It's, I would be listening to Macro Voices, Real Vision. I'd be listening to Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, Luke Croman, Lynn Alden. I, I'd be doing that eight hours a day anyway. So all I do is just turn on the, the webcam and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, there's that whole uh, Japanese concept called Ikigai, where it's like, it's what you love and what you can make mon money doing and, and what you're passionate about, all those things combined. I mean, it's finding that sweet spot. And, and a lot of people will say, oh, like you're like, not everyone's that lucky, right? Like, I, I call BS on that, because we're all human beings. And, it, you know, everything you see built around you is, is by human beings. So um, I think it's just a matter of, you know, finding that that source of contentment and, and sticking with it. Because for me, in the beginning, you know, you talk about kind of being a uh, like a lot of entrepreneurs have ADD. I was trying all these different businesses. I tried a magic website. I tried a senior living website, right? I tried an IT training website. It's just, you know, just trying to make money isn't going to do it. It's You got you to be like, George, you got to be passionate about macro um, or you got to be passionate. By the way, I don't play games anymore because my favorite thing is business, but I just kind of look at it in that lens. So, yeah. So why did those websites fail? Because you, you weren't uh, patch. I, I mean, because I don't think you would, you're the type of person that says you have to be ultra passionate about XYZ passive cash flow uh, website or, or, or do you have that mantra? Yeah, I, I think similar to you, if you're to strip everything away right now, what would I be doing? I would be learning and I would be teaching like uh, at, at, at its essence, I just want to be a teacher. And that's largely how we've been able to build everything so far. Um, I don't think I, yeah, with magic, you know, I looked into it a little bit. It's kind of cool, but it's not like marketing where I can continue to, to, to I, I, I actually have the passion to continue to stack and compound on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is those businesses failed because with those were all kind of partnership related because we didn't set proper expectations and roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so communication wasn't there as well. So it naturally started to kind of fan out and, um, you know, it didn't work out. So I see. Okay. So now I've got the table of contents here for the book. So the first thing that looks really interesting is defining well, newbie struggles, because I guess that applies to m the majority of the people listening right now. So and I know that and this is so cliche, but it's very true that you're your own worst enemy. And the, the, the reason most people fail from what I've seen is because they never try. They, they just sit there and think about doing it over and over and over again. The next thing you know, it's five years later or 10 years later, and then it's, it's kind of too late. And I was talking to Patrick Bet David the other day on an interview, and we were talking about how you at some point you've just got to go out and do it. No matter how bad you think you're going to suck, you are. I mean, look at my first YouTube videos they are horrible. But I didn't sit there and plan for days and weeks and hours. I just sit there and thought, okay, I need to do a YouTube channel. How do I do it? Bang, hit the record. Let's do it over and over and over again. Let's throw everything up against the wall. Let's try different edits. Let's see what sticks. Let's listen to the audience and then just iterate as we go. And the next thing you know, nine months later, you've got 100,000 subscribers where nine months later, most people would still be thinking about how to make it perfect without even starting, right? Yeah, I think everything you're saying. So Patrick, but David, you know, people, the people that watch you, that his stuff, your stuff, or even my stuff, largely what we're doing when we're teaching is we're trying to rewire people's thinking. We're trying to reprogram because the way we've been programmed for the first zero, what, zero to 18 years old or so, it's, it's just like, oh, you're taught to not fail. You're conditioned to not fail when actually failure is a prerequisite to success. And so that's, that's why 
you know, it's like, okay, why are you doing a book, Eric? Like nobody reads books anymore. Like Pomp told me that, right? Because nobody <laughs> reads books anymore. We're talking about on this podcast. And I was like, look, it, at the end of the day, you only write a book if you have a message. And I think for me, at least, I, I think we all have a goal of hitting our, our target audience, but there's over, over 3 billion people in the world that have played games and they need to understand that a, they can make an impact on the world, right? It doesn't matter if you play duck hunt or sports, sports counts too. Sports is a game. But my point here is if you look at it, something that's practical is look at the longest term investors out there. Let's look at a Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett. Look at how they think and largely how they think is just buy and hold for the most part, right? And I'm not telling everyone to do that, but when I look at everything that I've done, it's the things that I've stuck with, kind of to your point, the YouTube channel. Um, if I look at my podcast, if I gave up in the first two years, we wouldn't have leveling up. We wouldn't have marketing school, which now combined, they're at about 50 million downloads so far. And I'm not saying it's the biggest podcast. I'm just saying it takes time to compound. So, I mean, that's largely what you talk about with your audience. And it's the same thing here. What Whatever you decide to do in, in life or business, it's just how are you going to compound over time and are you enjoying the journey? Yeah, and, and you've got to not worry about making a fool of yourself. You've got to not worry about failing. You've got to not worry about perfection. Perfection, number one, you'll never achieve it, but it, you only get better by doing. It's very tough to get better just by thinking things through and, and whiteboarding them. You know, I, there's a really great YouTuber I like a lot. Think Media is yeah, Sean Sean Cannell. Cannell, I believe is his name. And he's got a lot of these great one-liners. And he says, listen, at a certain point, you've got to punch perfect in the face. And what he means by that is exactly what we're saying. You know, so many people get the paralysis of analysis and they just never start. And uh, but, you know, it's the exact same thing everywhere in, in real estate investing. As an example, when I first got into that in 2012, I would go to some of these local events, the it was the REI club or something like that. And man, so many people, like 90 percent of the people in there had never bought a property. And I'm like, well, how long have you been thinking about getting in real estate? Oh, well, you know, probably th three or four years now, but I've got my LLC set up. I've got my bank account set up. I've got my, my accountant set up. I've got all these things. Dude, pull the trigger, man. You, you got to shoot first and, and ask questions later where someone like, like me. And I, I think I had a huge edge from being an entrepreneur so long. I'm like, okay, just give me the basics. Let me take, uh, you know, a hundred thousand, let me, you know, let me take some money, buy a house, let me do it. And then I'll figure things out as I go. I, 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 and I'll have a lot more knowledge, a lot faster. You know, have you had that same type of experience or how do you make yourself just get off the couch and take action when you're concerned that you're not ready yet? You know, this comes back to thinking. And so, A, I, I think one thing is I think either blackjack or poker should be prerequisites in, at school because it teaches yeah. you risk taking, you know, bankroll management and all that. It teaches you long term stuff. Right. Yeah. I have a weird thing. And I don't know um, this can apply to everyone, but my my childhood, you know, sometimes Asian parents are really you have a tiger. It's known as a tiger mom, which it's a constant beat down the whole time. Right. It's, it's never good <laughs> enough. Right. And so I learned at a younger age and poker was really painful too. So I learned to reframe the pain into like, oh, this is fuel, like give me more. Uh -huh. And so that, now I will just kind of jump into things like, oh yeah, it's gonna be really painful in the beginning, but that's a prerequisite, give me more. And then I use it to motivate myself. Um, so it's kind of some sick reframing I've done in my head. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it'll work for everyone, but again, this ties back to thinking. A lot of this stuff in life is just like, oh, okay, let's reframe failure into, oh, it's a prerequisite to success. Um, let's reframe this whole pain thing into fuel, right? And if you re keep reframing all these things, then you have an edge over everyone else. And to your point, you just mentioned an edge as an entrepreneur. It's because you, you've it's you been rewired um, from all the kind of bad habits we learned, or the bad program we had, and the bad programming we had growing up. So I think that's a great point. I've never really thought about it too, because for me, my first instinct is just to do it. Like my first instinct isn't to sit back and try to perfect it and think about it. But I think that's because I was in the entrepreneur game for, you know, 15 years, just doing it and over Blackjack. and over and over and over again. So you just, at, at a certain point, it becomes second nature. We're, we're conditioned. So the thing is entrepreneur, that's one thing. And you're also conditioned for risk with blackjack as well as, as I'm conditioned for risk with poker. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's keep going, man. So how important or explain defining your mission? I think, I mean, we're talking about just getting off the couch and doing it, but I guess you do have to have the light at the yeah. end of the tunnel and you have to kind of have a game plan. Yeah. 
So before I answer that one, uh, I just want to caveat this. Towards the end of the book, there's a concept of the wealth ladder. And this is from a, a, the CEO of a company called ConvertKit. And at the very bottom rung of the ladder is where you're getting educated, you're learning. And then you go up, you're trying to build great habits around kind of what you do. And then eventually you get a job, a full-time job. That's kind of the career ladder, right? Um, you know, during that, you can decide to start a side hustle so you can build on top of that while you have some safety. Then you can decide to go build an agency or a service business, or you can build a drop shipping business and then you can have some success, decide to hold some inventory. And then you can go build products, right? Then you could go build a network effects business, right? Then you could go start investing in things. And so there's there's levels to everything. And the whole idea here is that you don't have to play at the highest level if you don't want to, that's fine. But if you want to get to the next level, you have to beat the current one or else you don't deserve to get to the next one. And so I think people try to skip and people like all the stuff we're seeing in society right now, like people complaining and things like that. It's just because they haven't beaten the current level. And right now, you know, you see maybe there's people like, oh, I want to try to break the system or something like that. Right. Um, anyway, politics aside. Uh, so I think. You know, you, I think your question was more around um, how can they their mission? You know, okay, got it, got it. They've got to have a game plan. Yeah. A, a, a ten, I don't want to say a game plan because it makes it sound too structured. I got I it. So you just got to have an end objective. Yep. Uh, to, to, so every morning when you wake up, you, you've got, okay, I need to do this, this, and this yeah. to get me one step closer to yep. where I want to be. I, yep. I don't like too much structure there because I don't yep. like a three year, five year goal because it's, it, it needs to be fluid. But, yep. but, you know, how important is that? And how would you suggest someone set that up for themselves to, to get that further motivation? So there's there's a lot of nuances to this answer. But, um, you know, for me, at least what worked for me, your knowledge may vary, um, is I didn't really start to define my mission until maybe two, three years ago. I, I didn't start to realize, oh, what this book is actually about. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the book took me five, six years to write, right? It, 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 they're like, what they tell you is like, oh, yeah, it takes five to six years. It actually took me that amount of time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on and off. So. Um, my, what really sparked, um, kind of how I thought to, to, to think, to think about the mission differently was, um, the guy I have in the book for the Ford, Howard Marks, he founded a company called Activision. And he also founded a company called Acclaim. These are big gaming companies. Mm -hmm. And now he's got a company called Start Engine. You know, his mission is to help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams. And I'm like, when I heard that, I was like, that's so broad. Like, why would you have a mission so broad? And then when you actually think about it, um, Zap, well, not Zappos, uh, Google's mission is to organize the world's information, right? Facebook is to connect the world. And so these are missions that will actually they'll probably never be accomplished. These are ongoing, it's gonna be ongoing work to get there. And so when Howard Marks mentioned it, he was speaking at my conference, he was like, look, that's what a mission is all about. It's it's not supposed to be achievable. So you can wake up every single day working towards it, right? Getting a little closer every single day and doing what you can. And then you can hand the mission off to somebody else. So broadly speaking, my mission is to level up the world, right? And I will never accomplish that. I just love learning and I love teaching. But I think if you're in your teens or you're in your 20s, I think there's still a lot of learning to figure out. There's a lot of learning to figure out who you are, what you want long term, and then you can define that overarching mission, right? You can have the overarching mission. You can have a 10 to 25 year BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. You can have a three to five year plan. Then you can have a one year plan. Then you can have a quarterly plan, right? There's a lot of plans. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. For for me, I just have kind of an overarching objective. This something that just kind of motivates me. What is it? And then I just every day I just try to make sure that I'm doing something that gets me closer to that goal. So if I find myself with like an hour or two to blow during the day after lunch or something, I'm like, okay, what can I do to get me just incrementally closer, even if it's one centimeter closer to achieving that overarching objective. But I don't try to do the three or five year thing because every point in my life, I have found that if I look back or if I went back three years ago and told myself that I'd be doing what I'm doing today, the, the three years ago me would have never believed it. Like if you went back in 2018 and said, oh, George, in 2020 or 2021, you're going to be in Phoenix. You're going to be doing this YouTube channel that has 170,000 subscribers. You're going to be blah, blah, blah. I said, you're absolutely crazy. But if you go back to 2015, I would have said the exact same thing about 2018. <laughs> and so I try not to, to get too uh, fixated with the goals there.
I'll, I'll tell you what. I mean, one more thing I'll add to this real quick is um, there's this concept of the vivid vision, and it's written by this guy named uh, Cameron Harold. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's that is basically a three year plan. And I, I wrote mine three years ago and it actually ends in 2021. And we, yeah, you know, we've had some things happen in the world, but largely everything has been accomplished. And I didn't, I, it's not like I think about it every day, but I think because I wrote it and the team saw it that um, we kind of, you know, just continue to move in that direction. So I don't know, maybe it's unconsciously in the back of my mind, but it did take me a couple of days to finish that. So. Yeah. How that, you know, that's, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but that's another thing I talked to Patrick bet David about, and I think it's vitally important and that's visualization. I just, I true, I saw a little, I don't know if it was in a fortune cookie or something like that, but the, the saying that the, the body can only perform what the mind can conceptualize. Right. And if you think about that, I just, it's so true. And I, I think I have a, a, a better understanding of that because my background in athletics when I was growing up and that you have to be able to visualize yourself executing on a specific shot, or you have to be able to visualize yourself winning or, or you're not going to win. And so how important is that in business? I mean, I, I think it's everything. I, I, I'm, I feel like you've read the, 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 the inner game of tennis, right? It's so I don't know if you have, it's a great book, but it, it's all about, kind of not trying to control everything, right? Yes, you have to absolutely work on your shot. Um, but the whole idea here is trying to control everything actually causes you to lose control. And so actually relaxing while you just continue to refine and work on what you're doing and nothing's good, nothing's bad. You just have to continue to work on what you're working on and slowly get there to your point, incrementally making progress every day. Maybe it's 1% better every day and just compounding and leveling up. That's what it is. Yeah, but as far as someone being able to see themselves achieve success. I think that's maybe another thing that keeps people on the couch is, is they just see what has happened or they just see their lives as of the last two years. And it's, it's so difficult to see them or, or for themselves to see success in the future because they're like, oh, I mean, I don't know. It can never happen to me. I'm just you know, I hear Eric and George talk about it, but they're different. They have a different skill set. And all they know is what they've experienced over the last five years. And so I think it's so much more difficult for that person to say, you know, have that goal. Let's say their overarching goal is to become a millionaire or to make $10 million or to live this, uh, this um, location independent lifestyle. And, but it's so, it just seems like a, a pipe dream, a fantasy. So, you know, how does that person kind of hack them, their own brain uh, or reframe their, their, uh, their thinking so they can actually say, yeah, you know, I can do that. Uh, maybe I put pictures up on my phone or my desktop or something that reminds I can do it. And therefore, I think it's if that if your mind is able to conceptualize and your body is able to execute. You know, you talk about um, kind of things to look at, right? I remember I bought this, uh, I bought this turtle over here. Just it's it's a reframe to get me to because I talk fast and I write really fast and all that just to slow down because sometimes my team has actually said it's hard to keep up with me, um, and you know it's so and I have on my my phone it says slow down too. So I think having that the 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 reinforcements around you definitely helps. That's one yeah. thing. But to your point, look in in, in games. I'll go back to that and for a second. Um, you have what's known as player characters. So these are people, you and I might be controlling a character, so we're actually playing. And then you have non-player characters. These are kind of the static characters that just stand around in town, right? These are the computers that you can go up and talk to. Um, most people in life end up being non-player characters because they complain about their circumstances, they're not good enough, all these things. It's because the information that they've been taking in hasn't been super helpful. It's been largely consumption instead of actually creating stuff, right? Even writing something is, is definitely creating. So I think, look, listening to you or Patrick Bet David or me, I think it's it's an inf it's the information diet that you have coming in because that refer that all you have, you have this information constantly coming in and you decide how do you want to filter it, but it does cause you to take either positive or negative action. So one actionable thing I think people can take um, or do, sorry, is actually go onto Clubhouse. There's a lot of millionaires and billionaires hanging out in Clubhouse, giving advice. And there's a lot of people, I can just see it. Like sometimes you'll say something and it's like, oh my God, mind blowing. I'm going to go do this right now. Right. And I think sometimes they just need that little push because I just want to set the tone. 
I don't know about you, but I was the ultimate failure, right? I almost got kicked out of high school because I didn't want to go to this, this elective class or, yeah, yeah. and then all these things, right? And so it's like, my thinking is, look, Mark Cuban has said this before. If I can do it, anybody can do it, right? That little different, he's a billionaire. But I just feel like we're all human beings and it's just about the information that we take and we're all very capable. And we, I think brain power, we, we barely use, you know, what, not, not even like 5% of our brain power or something like that. So, um, and you guys can go, you know, kind of correct me on that, but I think it's something <laughs> like that. Yeah, but the concept is, is still the same. And I think this also applies to people who, always tell themselves, or I always hear it in the comments when I do, when I talk to entrepreneurs, people say, well, I don't really, I don't know anything like macroeconomics, or I'm not a specialist in digital marketing. Therefore, if I set up a, a podcast or a YouTube channel, what am I going to talk about? The only thing that, that I do is I just go to the gym or I just do X, Y, Z. I don't have any specialty skills, but what that person doesn't realize is the beauty of YouTube uh, giving you access to basically 2 billion people is that there's so many of these micro niches out there where people are starving for the type of content or the type of information that just comes very easily to you. Something that you know, like the back of your hand, no matter how uh, simple or how basic you think it is, someone out there that that they're really in need of that information. So what's your experience there and, and what type of tricks do you have for people to maybe better understand the things that they know in their life, which would be a good niche that they're not even realizing right now? Yeah. So is your question more around how to find the right niche for people? Is that what it is? Yeah. But then also to to make sure people understand that you don't have to be an expert in health and fitness or something yeah. obvious. You know, you don't have okay. to be an expert on one of these big, huge categories. Yeah. You can be an expert in, um, you know, some specialty form of horseback riding. Right. And, and you can even niche it down from there. Like like uh, I know I talked to Miles Beckler and he's got a buddy that that his niche is this specialty form of horseback riding, but exercise drills for people who are interested. I mean, that is about as narrow as you can get. And the guy does extremely well. Yeah. So I'll tell you what, by, by the way, the reason my eyes were darting around, because I was trying to verify the 10% thing, that's actually a myth. So um, <laughs> I'm going to have to go deeper into that one. I'm going to pull that back. But I think, look, there's people, I was on Clubhouse, this is weeks ago, and then someone was talking about how someone got so niche that they were selling a course on how to um, how to help females uh, orgasm. I like I was like, that's very, very niche. And I've like never heard of that before. And apparently it does really well. So, you know, horseback riding, all these different things, you can definitely talk about it. There's people that um, talk about how to, you know, make potato guns and things like that. Right. And so I think the point is, Absolutely. You can, uh, you can monetize whatever it is that you know, and you can use a platform like Teachable, or you can use a platform like, uh, I think, Thinkific. These are all platforms you can use to make courses. They're all kind of done for you. And it's not super hard to create videos to gu guide people um, in terms of the knowledge that you have. And you can sell something and you can make a good, healthy six figures a year or even seven or eight figures from the course that you have. Um, now, you might be wondering, Oh, like, what if I'm starting out if I don't have anything to teach? Well, the beauty of it is, again, you have this phone over here, right? This phone, and you can actually document what you're doing for the first one to three years or so, and you're getting stronger and stronger. So people are going to follow you for that. This is known as building in public in, in the tech world. And what you can do there is you start to build an audience. And then after, you know, the two to three years, you can actually start to teach stuff. And then you can start to build this program, right? So I think you know, the best time to get started with learning is right now, but you can also start to actually create content right now because it typically takes two to three years to even start to build an audience. Unless you hit lightning in a bottle um, and you get really lucky, you know, that's how long I've seen it take. So, yeah, that's right. And you'll learn so much on the way. And I, I can almost promise you that where you start is not where you're going to be in a year, two years, no matter how much thinking and whiteboarding you do. The, the journey takes you on in all these different directions. All right. So let's go into, let's go back to the book here. We kind of got off on a, a tangent. So what is the apprentice mentality? Is that what you're talking about where you just want to kind of learn a skill as you're working, you've got that consistent income coming in, but then you start that side hustle that gradually grows 
and then you're able to to quit your business or explain that so to me. it's more so about having strong views and holding them loosely so for example if you ask me what percent brain power do we use if you asked me before i checked this thing I would have said 10%, right? <laughs> I don't know where I got that from, but I would I would have said it so confidently, right? Because I like I know, right? And then I just debunked my own stuff with with, with data. And so <laughs> I, I think it's just understanding that, hey, like it's okay to be wrong and you're gonna be more you're gonna be wrong more often than you're right. And right. it should be like that because you're constantly course correcting and you're iterating on, on data that new information that's coming in. And so it's it's you can call it apprentice mentality, you can call it having a beginner's mind. Um, because those that are stubborn stay stuck in their ways and they stay stuck and so i'll give it i'll give one example there's one person in clubhouse he is um you know he's well known but his business seems to be stuck and i i was observing him in clubhouse i was like oh wow i get why he's stuck now because he tries to control every conversation and he doesn't let people speak up mm -hmm. and so and that's the first time i've seen something like that i was like oh it all makes sense now i can see how he thinks i can see how he talks okay makes sense he doesn't have the apprentice mentality Oh, that, yeah, that makes so much sense, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's incredible. You hear someone just talk on their own podcast and it's just a monologue. And then it, 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 it's such a different dynamic. Maybe when you see them behind the scenes actually interacting with other people. When it's just not when it's not just them in front of the mic. Yeah, I never thought about that. Well, see, I, I for me, I try to ask, well, I try to act as stupid as possible. So that way I get as much information from people as possible. Um, so I just try to approach things from like, I just don't really know that much. And in the grand scheme of things, we don't really know that much. And in the real big grand scheme of things, you and I, we're not even a speck in the universe. Like we're not even, the world's been around for billions of years. We're not even gonna be around for like nothing, right? And so we just gotta understand that we don't know much and approach it from that mentality and enjoy what we're doing. Yeah, the, the humility I think is so huge. I was just talking to Lynn Alden last night about an interview Stan Druckenmiller just did with Goldman Sachs. And one of the things that we were talking about is how even Druckenmiller, I mean, arguably the best investor, at least within his time frame, you know, he usually invests about six months or so, it's his max. So he's not like a huge long-term guy like Warren Buffett, but within that, we'll call him a swing trader or something, uh, arguably the best in, in the last 30 years. And when you hear him talk to Goldman Sachs, he's talking about all the bets he's got set up, the, the, the major allocations in his portfolio. And he's like, well, I've got, you know, long, I've got the long end of the yield curve because if the Fed does this, then I'm going to win there. And then he's like, but then I've got commodities over here, which is a completely different bet, because if I'm wrong on that, then I'm going to be right over here. But the whole time he's acknowledging that, you know, I, I'm most likely going to be wrong over here. I'm most likely wrong here, most likely wrong here. I'm wrong all the time. I'm wrong a lot more than I'm right. But I just, I, my strategy is so darn good. And I'm so, I know I'm hedged so well. And I ride my winners. I cut my losers. And I know how to put the position size that he always comes out ahead. But the whole point is the humility there, where you take that to the, the opposite side, where most of the retail investors, you know, that are betting on XYZ stock or cryptocurrency, that they, they have no humility whatsoever. None. It's a, this is a for sure bet. And if you don't get on board, then you're just stupid, you know, and it, it, it's, it's just the, the difference between the ego. apprentice mentality, I guess. Totally. Yeah. There's a lot of ego, I, I think, um, especially, I, I mean, the ones that you see that, that actually have humility in the world of investing, those are the ones worth following, right? The mm -hmm. Charlie Munger the Warren Buffett's, the, the drunken millers of the world. Um, it, it, they come from a, Oh, like I'm just trying to learn more. Right. Howard Marks. I mean, the Oak tree investor, I get that vibe from him as well. So. Yeah. All, all the, all the greats are like that. I, I mean, they're, they all will acknowledge that they're going to get it wrong more than they're going to get it right. And they're always trying to poke holes in their own theory. And they, they, you know, they, they try to make sure that they're never in an echo chamber. And I think that's something that's very important in business as well, that you've, if you've got an idea, you know, okay, great, let's go for it. But you want to get second opinions. You want to try to, you know, how could I be wrong here? And then once you come to the conclusion, that you're correct, then you move forward. But then you're always, you always got an option where you can pivot and, and do something else, you know? 
So that's a big thing that you're talking about. And it's, it's part re related to the book too. So I talk about power-ups, part of power-ups might be habits, but the other part is mental models. And so mental models, Charlie Munger always talks about inverting. And that's basically what you said. What's okay. I might have this point of view, but what's the reverse. Can I argue against it? And can I argue it better than anybody else can? Right. right. And so these are all little tools that you get in your tool belt. And um, yeah, some power ups you have to continually refresh. Like if you're working out in the morning, you're meditating, whatever. Some you just get kind of get to keep, right? But the whole thing is, sure, there's 15 power ups in the book, but that's just the very beginning. It's it's not even scraping the surface. So yeah. So let's talk about routines. I see that in your your book as well, and uh, I think that's extremely important, especially when you're trying to scale a business. But uh, tell me about what uh, that chapter in the book. Yeah, I, I think. You know, at the end of the day, if we go back to compound interest again, well, if you compound your health, you compound your diet, you compound, you know, how well you rest when you go to bed. So I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for sleep optimization. Um, all these things stack up. And then the way when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, okay, today I got this interview with George. Um, I fill out my journal first. So there's, there's like this gratitude thing at the very top, three things I'm grateful for. So those of you that I might be losing right now, oh, this is cheesy, Eric, whatever. It actually helps because when you're grateful about something, you can't be angry, right? Try it. Try being grateful about something and then angry. You can't do it. And then three things I'm going to do today, one affirmation. That's great, right? And then, so that's one little power up that I get, one little boost, right? And then I meditate for, it could be anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. It's like, you know, being able to sit in silence, that's, that's forcing myself to quote unquote, slow down. That's why I have the turtle, right? I can't do anything. I stay in the present. I'm not trying to think beyond or, you know, in the past, you know, whatever's pissing me off. Like I have to kind of let it go at the moment. Um, then, you know, I'll do my, my quick body workout. Then I'll help on the bike. Right. But these are all power-ups where I'm releasing endorphins. I'm getting stronger and stronger every day. And then when the day starts, when this starts, for example, I'm ready to go. And so all these habits compound, but if you stop doing it, the compounding stops. It's like when you take money out of the market, guess what? The compounding stops. That's why time in market is greater than time in the market. I'm sure you, you've you had many guests say something like that in the past. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about thievery. What, what, what is <laughs> thievery? What is thievery? What are you, what are you implying there? Yeah. So thievery, I chose that word because there's cognitive dissonance when people hear that. I don't want to be a thief. I don't steal. I am completely original. We all like to think that we're original thinkers. Right. But the reality is to be original, you only need to be like 10 to 30% original. We're all borrowing off of concepts. Mm -hmm. So us doing a podcast, for example, is borrowed from radio, which was borrowed from something else in the past. Um, if you look at SpaceX's rockets, fundamentally the same design, but the big difference is it comes back to earth, right? And so if you look at this mouse right here, the final example I'll give, Steve Jobs says everything in life is a remix. They stole this mouse from, they stole the mouse from Xerox. They right. stole the graphical user interface. Picasso said great artists steal. So you have all these great people in the world. And my point is um, everything you're just iterating, right? You know, you have a software business, you're iterating on other software business, other technologies and things like that. So there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's it's a reframe again. It's okay. What else can I learn? Like listening to this podcast, for example, and how can I apply it to my specific situation? Because every single person's situation is different. And how can I use it to level myself up? And then again, continue to reprogram myself to make myself better. What do you do personally to filter out the the noise and know what to focus on when you're uh, trying to use something as inspiration? I guess that's the nice way of saying thievery, but and there's so much content out there. There's so, you know, social media and you just walk outside and you're being bombarded by ads and your phone is just always lighting up and making all these sounds. So how do you determine for yourself what you should be focusing on as far as those, those key things that you want to use as inspiration to improve and then what just, just you ignore? Yeah, it's funny. So I have two post-it notes. One is in my restroom. So I'm, when I'm brushing my teeth, I'm looking at the post-it. So it has my goals for the year. Um, it has business goals, health goals, personal goals, and vacation goals. And then I have one word of the year. My word of the year is harvest. So it's to not take on new projects. It's to harvest what we currently have. Uh, yeah. um, so I, I just try to stay focused. And I have one in front of my computer right here. Um, I just try to stay focused on leveling up the world in the context of marketing for right now that might expand later but that's all we do right now and i'm like okay does it fit into what i'm trying to do um if not probably not going to listen but if it's going to help my mindset in terms of thinking long term investing um that type of stuff or 
by the way, like when I eat lunch, sometimes I'll just watch your videos because you explain stuff so well, right? I was just watching one, the whole, I watched the whole thing on one X speed. I never do that, right? And so if if I feel like there's something I can learn from someone, um, then I'm absolutely going to just sit there and watch it. So my YouTube videos are all like the algorithm shows um, real vision. It shows you. It shows me watching some StarCraft pro matches sometimes. And um, it's mostly <laughs> stuff like that. So. Yeah, by the way, my videos are way better on 2x speed. Way, 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 way. <laughs> No, there's no way. I can't do it on 2x. So. <laughs> okay. All right, man. Let's talk about the final chapter in the book here. I think probably sums it up. And that's playing the game of life. Yeah. So I think when you play blackjack, there's, there's like, there's kind of a rush, especially when you, when the counts favorable to your side, there's like a rush. It's like, Oh, let's go. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and so same thing with poker or same thing when I'm playing a first person shooter. And by the way, again, I don't play games anymore, but I have that rush every day when I'm waking up. And so I look at everything like a game, right? I just talked about powering up every day in the morning. Um, and so even talking with you, it's like, Oh, this, this, this thing will compound like the, the, the hour we spend together here, it's going to compound into thousands of views. Right. Yeah. And so um, that, that's a little game within itself. How can I go find more leverage? Okay. Later I'm looking at, um, I'm going to be doing a clubhouse uh, podcast recording with Neil. We just used to do this type of thing. Now we do it on clubhouse. So we get even more leverage. Right. So I'm like, how can we play the game and expand even more, even more, even more. And um, you know, that's, that's how I look at life right now. It's just very much, it's not a chore because to me, you know, life is meant to be played until just enjoy the journey and then you die. That's it. It's not, there shouldn't be an end game, right? It's not like you're playing football and there's four quarters and then, you know, there's a, there's a, um, it's a zero sum game. There's one winner. Right. Um, and so, you know, th the way I look at it is if you look at it as an infinite game and you look at it as you're just trying to get your level up, you're leveling up every single day, just a little bit, then you're just going to enjoy the journey and you have fun while you're doing it. I think a lot of people, it's just like, oh, the game has to end at some point. But when you think about the long term, it forces you to think about how do I work with people that are smart, that are long term thinkers and people that I just like. And then you just keep repeating that. Yeah. And, and topics you like to discuss. Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, fantastic conversation, as always, for the viewers and listeners out there who want to grab the book or find out more about what you do. Where should they go? Yeah, they can go to levelingup.com. So that, that was a game within itself to pick up that domain. Um, but levelingup.com. And then you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Eric O-S-I-U. Awesome. Have a great day, buddy. Can't wait to do it again. Thanks for having me.